Hello, everyone. I'm Diego Torres Quintanilla. Um, I hail from Mexico. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Two Sigma. Uh, you will learn in a second how that is related to this talk or why it's relevant. Um, as you saw, the, the title of the talk is Cleaning, Optimizing, and Windowing Pandas with Numba. Uh, if you were playing very, pay, paying very close attention, you will see that the title of the talk changed last night at around midnight. Um, the other title is still relevant, but I think this one is better. Um, before we go any further, um, just like this talk is not about bears or cleaning their enclosures, this talk... I just closed my notes. <laughs> this talk is also not financial advice. <laughs> okay, here are my notes. <coughs> All right, so this is the agenda we're going to be going over. Uh, first, I will talk about the goals of the project that I'm discussing. Then I'll talk about the team. Then we'll do a quick introduction to windowing operations, uh, what I mean when I say windowing operations. <coughs> Then we will, uh, I will tell you the history of how these were implemented in Pandas. Then I'll talk about how they're currently implemented in Pandas and what are some issues uh, that that imp current implementation has. Then the meat of the talk is how to refactor them for flexibility, performance, and maintainability. Then how would this look with Numba? That's in the title. And... I guess one detail I'm giving away already is that the current implementation uses this thing called Cython, and I will tell you what that is, uh, to implement window ops in, in Pandas. Um, this project proposes using a different library, Numba. So we will discuss what we think uh, the advantages of using Numba over Cython are. So like I said, here are the project goals. We're trying to make Pandas windowing operations more maintainable, more flexible, and faster. Of course, none of this work is yet merged. We're, in fact, still discussing it. Uh, so if you want to join the discussion, if you are very invested in this topic, you have opinions, or you think you have seen things that could make this better, we invite you to please uh, join the conversation on that GitHub issue. All right, next up is the team. So these are the people involved in this project. Uh, first, I would like to mention Matt Roshk. Uh, he is a Pandas core dev. He is helping us do uh, basically all of the coding, and everyone else on the team is just happily sitting back, reviewing and discussing the code. Um, then we have Jeff Reback, a Pandas core dev. He's sitting back there. Um, he maintains Pandas, so he has been very instrumental uh, in this work. Uh, Phil Cloud helped us write the spec and review and discuss some of the work. And then that's me. Uh, that's a four-year-old picture of me. This is what I look like on GitHub. Uh, <laughs> I used everyone's GitHub picture, so I thought it was only fair to use mine as well. <laughs> All right, so like I said before, I work for Two Sigma. Uh, Two Sigma is a tech company in the financial services space. Like main, many finance companies, we really like data. Specifically, we like time series data, and as a consequence, we're very interested in windowing operations. This, this is why this project is close to our heart, and this is why we're working uh, with the Pandas core devs on this project. All right, so a very quick basic intro to window operations. So first, let's discuss what I think is the most basic case, a rolling mean. Uh, Rolling mean, the rolling concept, you can sort of think of it as a skateboard uh, moving over a vector. Um, so that's the skateboard. <laughs> so imagine you have a vector, and this is the input vector. And it's just 1, 2, 3, 1, 5, 6, 7, 8. Say that you want to uh, get the rolling mean of this input vector uh, with a window size of 3. By window size of 3 here, I mean... Uh, three observations uh, are being considered when you do the mean. So 
when you want to calculate the first element of the output vector, since you only have one observation so far in your rolling window, the rolling window is the green box, um, then you only average that one element. So the, the mean of one is just one. The mean of one and two is 1.5, and the mean of one, two, three is simply two. Now, this is where it gets interesting. We're calculating the mean of the window size of three. So when we go on to the next element, the green box won't just expand. It will shrink on the other side. So we have sort of the one on the right. We leave out the one on the left. Uh, we still have the same average because the same element that came out also came in on the other side. And then we can keep going. Uh, I want to, at this point, hint at you at a possible optimization for calculating the rolling mean. Uh, I will, in fact, go back to this case. Notice that we were calculating the mean of 1, 2, 3, and then a number came in, 1, and a number abandoned the calculation, also 1. Um, so you can imagine uh, an implementation of the rolling mean. Instead of calculating the mean of all those three numbers, uh, every time you move the window, you can simply uh, keep a running sum. And then when you shift the window to the right, you add the element that came in. You subtract the element that just left the window. And now you can divide by the total, which, of course, you're also keeping a running count of. And that gives you the rolling mean. And that uh, lets you do way less operations because you only have to do uh, operations over the, over the size of the window, over how many elements you slid uh, in and out. Of course, there are many other kinds of uh, window operations. Rolling mean is a thing that sort of often people call them sliding windows. It's just the green box sliding over the vector uh, and then doing an operation over the elements inside that green box. There's also expanding windows. Here, I guess, the metaphor I'm using is that uh, an expanding window is an ocean wave. And this is expanding max. So this time, instead of calculating the mean over the green box, we're getting the maximum. And so when the green bo uh, box expands, we just find the new maximum. There's a graphic error in my slide. Um, all right. So, so far we have been looking at window operations with a fixed window size. When I say fixed window size, I mean the size of the green box is always a constant amount of observations. Uh, but this is not necessarily what you want. Um, if you are all familiar with pandas, you will know that uh, pandas series or data frames often have an index. And that index gives you an indication as to the ordering of the elements uh, in your series or or data frame. So sometimes you want to express the window size in terms of units of the index. So here, don't get confused. It's no longer input output. Both are the input data now. On the top row, I have the index. And assume this is an index by day. And then on the second uh, row, I have the data. So this means, for example, that this is an observation for the first day. These two our observations for the second day, and so on and so forth. So this time, when you do a rolling mean by time, say that we're doing three days, and we're calculating the rolling mean uh, for this four over here, this time you will have way more than three elements on the green box. This time, the green box spans from day two to three to day four. Uh, so we have six observations, even though we're doing three days. This is what, inside the pandas code base, is known as a variable width window. Then there are many more complex cases. Uh, the one I want to talk about is exponentially weighted rolling average. Uh, people usually don't call it rolling average. That's not what it's called in pandas. People usually refer to it as the moving average, or EMA for its uh, initials. I will be calling it EMA. So EMA is similar to a moving average, except that before you uh, calculate the average, 
you weight your things, you weight the observations, and you weight them by an exponentially decaying weight. So the weight of this observation is twice as much as the weight of this observation, which is twice as much as the weight of this observation. <coughs> and uh, image just the green box keeps sliding uh, or growing, uh, sort of depending on who you ask. Anyways, so that's a quick run through of window operations. What do they look like in pandas, or where do they live? You've surely seen them in the uh, methods uh, that are available in the data frame and the series. They're dot rolling, dot EWM, and dot expanding. So know that this API is already hinting us at how um, these operations should be implemented. There are rolling window operations. There are EWM. Notice that there is no A there. It's not exponentially weighted moving average. It's just exponentially weighted moving something. And then there's expanding. And this suggests that you can have a rolling mean, uh, exponentially weighted moving variance or mean, or an expanding minimum or maximum, for example. And another thing I wanted to mention is these uh, operations have sort of grown in the pandas code, within the pandas code base fairly quick. Um, in March 2016, rolling EWM and expanding were first introduced as methods and series and data frames. Before that, uh, rolling mean was implemented directly by a method called rolling mean. And this was sort of not a very uh, scalable approach because you would end up with rolling underscore mean, rolling underscore variance, rolling underscore anything. And then you would have had to have a rolling apply uh, for users to be able to bring in their own functions. So this was not sustainable. This is why the methods were created. Uh, also in May 2016, just one minor version above uh, in the versioning scheme, rolling and resample were added to group by. Then in December, uh, merge asof was introduced. I won't really discuss, discuss much of merge asof. Just know that it is very similar uh, to a rolling uh, join. And if uh, you're an expert on this topic, that might be interesting to think about. And rolling started accepting time series offsets, uh, the more complicated ones, in 2016 as well. So before, you could only do a rolling mean of three days. When this feature came out, you could do a rolling mean of three custom business days, and then you could implement your own definition of what a business day is. Uh, this is, of course, of great interest to the finance industry. Um, and then 2018, rolling and expanding gained a raw argument that added a significant amount of complexity to the API. The raw argument lets you pass in a, when you do a rolling apply, for example, it lets the function that you're calling take in a NumPy array as opposed to a Panda series. And this gives you more control over uh, what, exactly that, what exactly is being applied. Anyways, so with quick turnaround time came some bugs. So everything I'll be showing you now is the change log of Pandas over time. So this, I believe, was from the first, from the version right after rolling uh, and expanding and blah, 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 were added as methods. And you sort of kept piling on. Notice how the last one is really long. So uh, for the next few slides, I would like to walk you through why, why we think, in retrospect, this happened and what we think can be done to, uh, to help fix this issue. So before I show you actual code, know that the code that I will show you in a second is actually not Python code. It's Cython code. Cython is, um, it has a syntax that's <coughs> very, very similar to Python. Um, except that you add a few bits here and there. Most notably, you add type annotations to it. And in exchange, it gives you native level performance. Cython is a compiled language. You can compile it in advance, turn it into machine code. Therefore, it is really fast. Uh, when you call to Cython code, uh, the Python interpreter can release the gil uh, when Cython code is being called. This gives you much better uh, multi-threading characteristics as well. And 
Uh, you can also call Python code from Cython code. So your Cython code, even though it's running in, uh, in as native machine code, it can say, okay, now I want to call out back to this function in the Python interpreter. This is very important because this is how user-defined functions are implemented. When you say rolling apply, the rolling part is being, uh, is a for loop running inside Cython, but Cython has to call back to Python to run the function that you provided, which is written in Python. And this is at the core of the uh, performance issue that uh, I'm trying to hint at is very important. We want everything running in native machine code. We don't want this sort of context switching, which slows us down. All right, so finally, we have some code. This is a snippet of code from rolling apply. Um, notice that here it's called roll generic. Generic means it could be, you could be applying any function. Notice first the type annotations. Some of the type annotations are not very il illuminating. Notice that uh, this parameter called func is being passed. And this parameter, par parameter func, is the user defined function. And it is defined as an object because in Cython you cannot type annotate a Python function. It uses Python types. Uh, it is not necessarily deterministic in the type, of, in the type that it returns. Uh, so you cannot annotate it. Then here you'll see <coughs> Cython code is actually, it actually looks a lot like Python. So this does give you the great advantage of writing Python-like code with great performance, and this gives you a reasonably uh, beginner-friendly uh, code base as well. Cython is not that hard to write. It looks like Python, and that's the whole point of the project, that it looks like Python. Yeah, that's the use of defined functions. Now here's the code for rolling mean. Uh, again, notice that it looks a lot like Python. Notice also that it releases the jail. So in this critical section of code where it says with no gil, that code inside does not have the global interpreter lock, and the interpreter can go do something else while this code is running. Like I said, it's not Python. You will see this is a Python syntax error. This is like a C idiom for passing things by reference, so you're passing pointers to those things. This makes the code uh, more efficient uh, rather than passing a copy. So between these two slides, um, and just this same code is moving to the right, I kind of want to zoom out on this code. I want to show you what is above and around it. So right above this code, you will see that uh, this section is inside an, an else clause. And right above it, of course, is the uh, if part of the statement. Um, and you will see this branching. If is variable, then do this. Else do that. And you can sort of see that the code is not completely different. It's actually kind of similar. It's not straightforward how you would generalize for both sides. Um, it seems it's, it sort of sounds like the variable size should be able to handle a fixed width window. So it seems like this is a more general version of the thing on the right. So why is this happening? You will find an explanation right above this code in a comment. And it reads as this. For performance, we are going to iterate fixed windows separately. It makes the code more complex as we have two paths, but it's faster. So you're, there's a clear trade-off going on here. There's a trade-off between maintainability on one hand and performance on the other hand. Uh, and this code opted for, opted for performance. And I think this is part, this is, uh, this can sort of explain why we have seen uh, bugs arise in this way uh, within these features. Uh, maintainability has sort of become uh, more difficult as new features were added, particularly because many of these features were sort of added as like extra sections of code that were never really consolidated with the rest. 
So here is the code for rolling apply again, except this time I zoomed out. So I think before I showed you, was it the bottom part or maybe the middle part? No, it was the bottom part. It was the for loop. This time I zoomed out. I still didn't show you some parts, but really what I want you to notice here is that the same if else happens again. You get the same branch, the same repetition, and this was done clearly for the same reasons. There is a trade-off to be made between performance and maintainability and performance one. All right, so our project concerned itself with trying to, at the same time, clean up this code, but also make it more flexible, more maintainable, uh, so that uh, we can plug into this code and implement our own functionality at Two Sigma, but we also wanted to make sure that uh, this code is easier to maintain, both for Jeff and all the other maintainers who own it. Um, and we think that this is contributing back to the community uh, a decreased potential of bugs in these features in the future, as well as the pluggable API we want to make will also be available to the community. So early on in the project, we gave ourselves some requirements. We wanted to make the code uh, for windowing operations easier to read. We wanted to have pluggable support of custom window operations. Uh, so say that rolling, I don't know, as an example, say that rolling standard deviation is not implemented. A user should be able to, a power user, should be able to implement their own rolling standard deviation and be able to take advantage of all the performance gains that the pandas code base is getting from running machine, uh, native machine code. So we want the user to be able to drop down to that level if they find it necessary to get the performance they need. We also wanted to keep all existing tests. Uh, we know that uh, Pandas is a tool relied upon by many, many folks, and so we found it unacceptable to break any existing tests because that would probably break uh, user space code. And of course, for the same reason, we wanted to keep the existing APIs. We, don't, we didn't want uh, users to have to go and change their code after this project. And we also decided we wanted to avoid all uh, large performance regressions. We think that in most places we will have performance improvements, but we have identified some spots where maybe large performance improvements won't be possible, and maybe a few small ones where we might have small regressions. We think the regressions are acceptable as long as they are outweighed uh, by, by greater maintainability gains. So how do you actually write uh, these, these window operations so that they're generalizable? So that uh, if you are missing just one small component, if Pandas already has the code to implement a rolling thing over a time, uh, over a time series, and you're just missing the last spot, the dot apply, your dot apply is not optimized, how do you implement? Um, so this came from the very beginning. It's in our specification. We wanted to um, separate uh, the concerns of, of applying windowing, windowing operations into three components, an indexer, an aggregator, and a kernel. The indexer, all it does is it calculates the bounds of each window. So for the green box that we were seeing sliding, the indexer simply decides where the green box starts and where the green box ends. The aggregator, it's a little bit hard to explain, so I'll explain the kernel first. The kernel simply knows how to apply a mathematical operation. Uh, for example, we would expect a mean kernel to exist, and the mean kernel knows how to compute the average of a set of numbers. The aggregator is sort of the intermediary between the indexer and the kernel. It knows how to, for each change in the window bounds, how to call the kernel in an intelligent way that optimizes over the kind of window that you're using. This is a bit confusing, so let's just use an example. I think that will clarify things a lot. So this is how we think uh, uh, rolling mean should be structured. So we have a rolling indexer, and a rolling indexer just knows how to apply a rolling window. We have a subtractable aggregator. Uh, a subtractable aggregator basically applies an optimization that I was talking about earlier before, 
to make a calculation of a rolling uh, window much faster. And then there's a mean kernel. The mean kernel just knows how to compute the mean. And this is what they do. Get window bounds. If you're just doing a rolling indexer, the window bounds simply the begins just always moves by the size of the window. And the other end also moves by the size of the window. So it looks like a skateboard rolling over your uh, vector. Then let's talk about the kernel first. The kernel knows how to add a number to the current sum, to the current running sum. And it keeps count of how many numbers are currently in your window. And then the aggregator is the smart, smart thing that realizes that uh, things are coming into scope and are coming out of scope of the window. And then it just says, OK, for the things that went out of scope in the window, let's call invert. And invert is the thing that just subtracts them from the rolling sum. And then for the things that just joined the window, that just entered the green box, you add them to the running sum. And then the very last but important thing that the mean kernel has to implement is the finalize method. And in finalize, uh, for a mean, you just divide by su the sum, by the, by the count of elements, and voila, you have your average. And of course, this works for any windowing operation you can think of. You can implement a rolling max, an expanding max by using the expanding indexer, a subtractable aggregator, because you can apply the same optimization of adding things. Notice that uh, invert will never be called here because the left side is always at the beginning, and then the max kernel. I just want to emphasize again, this max kernel that we would use in expanding max would be the same max kernel that we use in a rolling max. So you can share code. For a user-defined expanding operation, you can use the same expanding indexer. This time, you have to use a different aggregator. You don't know if the user function is smart enough to subtract elements uh, or to just add a specific element. So the apply aggregator would be a very simple aggregator that simply computes the, uh, calls the kernel uh, for the whole window without any optimization. And then we have a UDF kernel, uh, which is really just a callable. And it doesn't have to do anything smart, because we used the DOM aggregator that doesn't expect anything from you. Of course, a power user could implement the methods invert and add, and then say, hey, I don't want the, ap the apply aggregator I implemented the protocol uh, that satisfies the requirements of the subtractable aggregator. So please give me that aggregator instead. And that's how you implement a more efficient operation. And the same goes for EMA. You would have a rolling indexer with an EMA aggregator. The EMA aggregator would know how to compute the weights. Uh, and then it just calls the mean kernel in the, in the same way as the regular subtractable aggregator. And this is why we're very interested in this at two sigma. At two sigma, we would be able to implement our own indexer, aggregator, and kernel, and plug, it, plug them into pandas and do the exact operations that we want to do that we think are so special. All right. So I haven't mentioned Numba in the whole talk, and I only have like 10 minutes left. Uh, so let's start talking about Numba. Um, who here is familiar with Numba? Can we do a quick show of hands? OK, great. So I'm glad I'm explaining what Numba is. Numba is a just-in-time compiler for Python. So it generates machine code for uh, given some Python code. The core difference that it has with Cython, which is what I've been showing you so far, is that uh, although code is compiled in both cases, in Numba, code is compiled at runtime. So in Cython. You have to compile the code when you ship your package to your users. You have to do it before that. Numba can take any code at runtime, compile it, and run it at, at, at runtime without restarting the interpreter, without nothing. So this is how you uh, JIT compile or just-in-time compile some Python code. You add the ngit, 
uh, decorator, and now Numba goes and it turns this code into machine code. Numba can also do this for a class. So with the JIT class decorator, you can also generate machine code for all of that class. And this is why we think uh, Numba is a great fit for this project. We can add uh, the JIT class decorator to our aggregator, our indexer, and our kernel. And users, power users, of course, would be able to do this at runtime themselves if they wanted to. So in a notebook, they would be able to write their own kernel, JIT compile it, uh, and then have pandas run it for them. And this time, uh, this time they would get machine level performance for the entire uh, cycle of, co of calling your window <coughs> operation. There would be no step where uh, machine code is calling into Python code, like with the old rolling apply. Instead, uh, number functions calling each other never have to abandon uh, the, the compiled space. They never have to get back the interpreter lock. It can all happen in machine code space. All right. So, of course, there's reasons why Cython has been used uh, all this time. I do want to say Cython existed before, um, but there are other reasons. Uh, so let's talk about the trade-offs here. What are Numbas' strengths and what are its weaknesses? So I think one very strong uh, side of Numba is that it takes native Python. So all valid Numba code is valid Python code. Um, Numba code is easy to debug in most cases. Assuming you did not do anything that upsets the JIT compiler, but instead uh, there is a bug in the code <coughs> you wrote, uh, like a human mistake, you can simply remove the JIT decorator. And now you're debugging Python code. And you can use PDB or any of the other tools that you know and love to debug your Python code. Another strength is that users can write their own UDF and compile it all at runtime. So they don't have to pre-compile a library to be able to use it uh, with a number version of windowing operations in Pandas. So what are the weaknesses? Number is still maturing. It's been around for a few years now, but it's not quite at the same place in the development cycle as Cython is, for example. Also, Pandas already depends on Cython. It does not depend on Numba today. So being able to do this work with Numba would imply uh, convincing all of the core developers that, this, that adding this dependency is a good idea. And if you do something that offsets the JIT compiler in Numba, I'm not going to say that Numba, Numba issues are always easy to debug. You will run into cases where you get a, a mysterious stack trace from Numba, particularly that power user that's trying to write their own uh, user-defined function that does something very smart. They might get a compilation issue, uh, a typing error, most likely, and it might, be, it might get a little bit mysterious. So that's pretty much it. That's a summary of the project. Um, like I said in the very beginning, all this work is still in discussion. It is not yet in mainstream pandas. Uh, we're talking to core devs. We're talking to the community to see whether a number dependency would be uh, well accepted or whether they think that maybe we can implement the exact same thing but just use Cython. Uh, so we would still clean up the code, but maybe not open as many use cases of uh, compiling code while, it's, uh, while the interpreter is running. Um, you know, there are some cases where Numba is not perfect yet, and compiling Cython code that is much more performant is sometimes easier. Uh, but we think many of these issues can be ironed out with the Pandas team and the Numba team working together. Uh, so, so we think that Numba is quite ready, or if not, almost ready for Pandas to use it extensively. Another consideration, another possibility is to make Numba optional. So, implement everything in Cython, and if a user brings in a Numba function, then we can try to use it and call it from Cython and still allow the user to never read machine code space 
uh, but not bring Numba as a hard dependency of the Pandas project. And yeah, that's it. Uh, I'll give some time for Q&A. Also, here is the license for the little red bug that I used. I'm required <laughs> to show this by the license. Uh, and yeah, thank you all. We have five minutes for Q&A. Uh, what's the hesitation to include numbers dependencies? Why are they hesitating to include numbers dependencies? Uh, so pandas has very few dependencies. So adding another one is not a small deal. It means all of the users, all of all pandas users, will have to bring in a new dependency into their environments. There has also been some discussion about uh, we're not sure if Numba has great support for all of the architectures that uh, that uh, Cython supports. Uh, so that might be a consideration as well. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about how, you know, the assumptions that Numba makes on, on the jail and how it interacts with that? So I guess what I'm saying, I pass in a Numba function, you're going to make assumptions around whether you can release the jail or, or not, and yep. how does that impact on what I can write? Yep. Uh, so Numba lets you decide whether you want to turn off the jail or not, and it sort of leaves it up to you. So you're not going to have the with no jail thing in the code that would go away. Well, the decorator lets you specify oh, right, right. whether you, you want to keep that the user that would go away from the pants. The with no jail would go away, but the decorator might have right. jail equals two. Yes. How much of a performance hindrance is um, the concept switching in Cython with going from the C++ code to the user fight function? Is it noticeable in your analysis? Um, so. It is hard to measure like, how much effect it has, because when you're doing a context switch, you're moving from something that is really fast, uh, Cython, to something that's generally much, much slower. Uh, so it's actually just the fact that you're moving to something slower. That slow thing dominates the time. Um, one thing that you will find out is that if for a rolling apply in Pandas as is, you just threw away the Cython implementation and implemented it in Python, you wouldn't see any difference because the slow Python code that you provided is probably what dominates the complexity. Cool. If there's no, oh, question. Is the rolling window data, is that a Panda series or a NumPy array? Um, so, the thing you call the rolling method on is a pandas series. You know there is a raw argument on rolling and expanding. If you pass raw uh, and then you pass in a, a function, so you say rolling raw true apply, then the function that you pass in apply, instead of seeing a series, which is the case when raw is false, when raw is true it will see a array. Cool. Well, thank you all so much. I'll hang around if there's more questions. <laughs>